Good evening, everyone, and cheers. I'm Louise Mirror. As most of you already know, the very lucky and proud person who gets to be called president of the New York Historical Society. I hope you're all healthy and safe this evening as you watch this evening's special program, A Midsummer Conversation, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, which is presented exclusively for a New York historical and offered by invitation only. Just before I introduce our speakers, I want to recognize and thank New York historical trustees who have joined us this evening. Among them, our board chair, Pam Schaffler, the chair of our chairman's council, Susan Danilo, and Michael Weisberg and Suzanne Peck, who are deputy co-chairs of our chairman's council. We're grateful indeed to Pam for her outstanding leadership and to Susan, Michael, and Suzanne for their extraordinary work on our behalf. I wanna thank all of you who have joined us this evening, our trustees, our chairman's council members, our legacy council members, and many others of you who have so generously supported us at New York Historical. It is your generosity that has enabled us to continue making history matter in these challenging times. Now then, to our speakers. We are honored this evening by the presence of patriotic philanthropist, author, television host, and co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlisle Group, David Rubenstein, who has joined us on many occasions on the stage of our Robert H. Smith Auditorium at New York Historical, and who we are delighted to welcome back this evening virtually. Among his many endeavors, David is chairman of the Board of Trustees of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and the Council on Foreign Relations. His book, The American Story, Conversations with Master Historians, showcases a wonderful repertoire of his discussions with our nation's most renowned historians and other scholars. David is also the author of the forthcoming How to Lead, uh, an illuminating and quite instructive work, um, which I can say from having had the opportunity to read the galleys is an absolute must read. The book is out officially on September 1st, look for it. David is also the host of New York Historical's own PBS television series, History with David Rubenstein, which is featured on PBS stations across the nation, including WETA in Washington, DC, and WNET Channel 13 right here in New York. David Blight is Sterling Professor of History and Director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University, as well as a New York Historical Trustee. He's the author or editor of numerous books, including annotated editions of Frederick Douglass's first two autobiographies. His most recent book, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom won the 2019 Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction, as well as the 2019 Bancroft Prize, the 2019 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize, and the 2019 Francis Parkman Prize. In 2001, he was awarded the Frederick Douglass Book Prize for Race and Reunion, the Civil War in American Memory. Tonight's program will last about an hour, including 15 minutes for questions and answers. Your questions can be submitted via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. In the interest of simplicity, we've disabled the chat function tonight. So please do remember to use the Q&A. Our speakers will get to as many questions as time allows. And now I am delighted to hand the program over to David Rubenstein. Thank you very much, Louise, and thank you all for joining us this evening. And David, thank you very much for joining us from your home in the New Haven area. Seems like you have a lot of books behind you. I assume <laughs> you've either written or read all those books, right? Well, I make them look like I've read them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to talk to, tonight about your book on uh, Frederick Douglass, which won the Pulitzer Prize and well-deserved. It's an extraordinary book. Before we get into it, though, I'd like to just address two issues that you're familiar with. Uh, that really have come up since you wrote the book. One is with respect to John Lewis. Uh, he was buried recently. Um, I would think it's fair to say, as we'll talk about shortly, that Frederick Douglass was without doubt the most prominent African-American of the 19th century, and maybe one of the most prominent African-Americans ever. 
but one of the most prominent African Americans of the 20th century was John Lewis. Did you know him and did you spend any time with him? Uh, well, thank you, David, and thanks, Louise. Um, I thank you all out there for joining us tonight. I did know John Lewis. I had the great privilege of uh, joining him three times on the pilgrimages he did annually in early March to Alabama, uh, the Civil Rights Pilgrimage. Uh, it was actually called the Congressional Civil Rights Pilgrimage because many Congress people went on those. Uh, I went twice to Alabama and I also went once to Charleston on his pilgrimage. Uh, we went to Charleston the year after the massacre there in 2015. Uh, and all, <laughs> I could go on all night about John. Uh, what, what one has to imagine is being on a bus on that highway from Selma to Montgomery and the man who stands up at the front of the bus and takes the microphone as, as your guide is John Lewis. That's what happened. Um, it, I met him a couple of other times as well. Uh, everything you've heard about him is true about him being sweet and gentle and kind and solic solicitous of everyone else around him. But also I saw the fire of his passion on those pilgrimages when he spoke. And to me, John Lewis was frankly um, an American prophet. He was to me like uh, an Isaiah uh, walking around in the blue suit of a congressman right among us. Um, he tended to speak sometimes in oracles like the Hebrew prophets did. And uh, he is the embodiment of the civil rights movement, especially the nonviolent uh, stage uh, or core of the civil rights movement. And there are lots of comparisons we could actually draw back to Douglas. Well, let's talk about one other thing before we get into Frederick Douglass specifically. Uh, because of the aftermath of the killings of uh, uh, you know, in a, a number of prominent uh, individuals, African Americans who were uh, treated very poorly by police and other kinds of things that have come to the fore. We have uh, looked at, again at monuments and memorials, and we have uh, decided in some cases that maybe we should tear down some of the memorials. In some cases, there have been resistance to that. You've written an op-ed article that talks about how we might treat these monuments and memorials, and I would like you to just explain to people your own view on these monuments and memorials. Should we tear them down if they were uh, defending the Confederacy or should we keep some of them? In particular, would you mention the Freedmen's uh, Memorial that uh, Frederick Douglass spoke at, the dedication of that, which is one that's now seen as a kind of anti-Black, anti-African-American, the way it, a slave is portrayed. Can you talk about that and your whole theory about these monuments and memorials? Sure, well, that Freedmen's Memorial in Washington uh, the, the famous statue of the standing Lincoln hovering and his arm extended over the kneeling slave is a controversial monument, no question. It was controversial from the moment it was unveiled uh, in April of 1876 uh, because of that depiction of the kneeling slave and the nearly godlike Lincoln. I personally, when I found out that it was endangered of being either torn down or removed, uh, officially, I wrote the fastest op-ed I've ever written. I wrote it in two hours uh, that day, uh, and I sent it to the Washington Post, and they published it the next morning. And my view on that monument is that it should not be removed, and the reason is my own as a historian. I'm not speaking for anybody else on this, but, but that mon monument should remain, I think, because it was made sacred space to me particularly because of the fact that the, the people who raised the money for it were African-Americans. The first $5 given by a woman named Charlotte Scott, a former slave. We know a great deal about the man who was modeled, Archer Alexander, who was modeled for the kneeling slave. He's had a very interesting life in his own right in Missouri. Uh, the entire event of the unveiling was an African-American uh, performance. Uh, it began with a huge parade all over the city of Washington. The master of ceremonies was John Mercer Langston, the dean of the Howard Law School. An AME bishop gave the convocation. A young black poet read an original poem. And Frederick Douglass, as you say, was the orator of the day. And the speech that Douglass gave at that unveiling is, in my view, 
and I've read all of his speeches, <laughs> was the second greatest speech of his life. Uh, the first is his 4th of July speech from 1852. But the speech Douglas gave there that day is a brilliant, insightful treatment of Lincoln himself. It's a very honest treatment of Lincoln himself. And it is also an appeal to the audience that day, which was an extraordinary audience. President Grant, President's cabinet, members of the Supreme Court, and members of the House and the Senate were all there. And no African American ever had that audience again until Barack Obama gave his first inaugural address. So I think the fact of how this monument came about, how it was unveiled, what it meant at that moment, has to be factored in before we just remove it. Furthermore, we've just recently learned, I did not know this, even when I wrote the op-ed, we've recently learned uh, from at least three newspaper clippings that within five days of that unveiling, Douglas himself in a Washington DC newspaper advocated that a additional monument ought to be erected there at the site uh, not replacing the standing Lincoln and the kneeling slave, but an additional monument ought to be erected, said Douglas, showing a more robust, uh, if you like, positive image of emancipation. So in the piece I wrote, not even knowing that Douglas had said that, I had never found those clippings. Friends of mine just found them. I said, why not build an additional emancipation memorial right next to it? Put the two there together, one from the 19th century, which belongs kind of out of the 19th century, and one from now, however we want to inspire artists to imagine it. My overall view of all this monument removal is number one, we can't stop it. Uh, I would prefer they not be torn down by crowds, although, the amazing art that has come out of the graffiti <laughs> on Monument Avenue in Richmond is itself become a kind of artistic event. I always prefer if monuments are going to be reconsidered and removed that is done through some deliberation. These are always local matters to a degree, unless we're talking about the monuments inside the US Capitol. That's, that's not local. That's an act of Congress although each state gets two monuments, as you know. Um, and if Confederate memorials are coming down, and they surely seem to be, if the Confederate memorial landscape, 1,700 Confederate monuments or thereabout, if they are generally, mostly, or all gonna be removed, then we need to be thinking as a culture, seriously, about what kind of new 21st century memorial landscape we might want to imagine. And we need to rethink, in my view, whether the only object of memorialization ought to be so-called heroes. We get into a lot of trouble when we try to select heroes. Even the greatest of heroes sometimes have their flaws, obviously. So maybe we need to be thinking about events, concepts, ideas, processes, and a whole new kind of modern conception, perhaps, of memorialization. And one can hope that in the coming year or so, uh, depending on what happens to our national politics, that some kind of national reckoning with these monuments, even though they are generally local, uh, might come about. And I, I actually, just one last thing, David, I did an op-ed, as you know, in the New York Times suggesting that perhaps the Biden campaign ought to get behind this, create a task force, and so on, and so on, and so on. That hasn't happened yet, and it may not happen, but I've had dozens and dozens of emails from people, not just telling me that they want to be on this fictitious commission, but telling me what's going on in their town telling me what's going on in Los Angeles, what's going on in St. Louis, what's going on in Minneapolis, what's going on in their local neighborhood with all kinds of reimagining of memorials. Somebody needs to start harnessing that and get a grasp on it from a national point of view. So David, um, you have devoted your entire academic life. It's essentially to studying slavery, the after effects of slavery, 
things relating to uh, civil rights and, and, and the Civil War. What prompted you to devote your entire academic career to this area? Did you, were you find it interested in, in this as a child? Did it happen later in life? And uh, where did the interest come from? Well, it, it isn't that complicated. It's partly a, a matter of time and place. I, I came of age in the late 1960s, 1970s. Uh, when I was in, I had two really good high school history teachers. They did not inspire me to do African American history. In fact, I learned little, if any, African American history in high school, although I did have two great history teachers. It was in college that I first encountered uh, anything resembling black history. I took the first ever black history course taught at Michigan State when I was an undergraduate, either in 1968 or 69. And then I was a high school teacher for seven years in my hometown of Flint, Michigan in the 1970s. And we were all creating, or we were trying to create, courses in black history. We didn't exactly know what we were doing. I got the school to buy, as I recall, about 200 copies of John Hope Franklin's classic textbook, From Slavery to Freedom. I got him to buy copies of Kenneth Stamp's Peculiar Institution, which is all we had to teach with. But then when I went off to graduate school, by then, again, from growing up in a time and place, inspired by the civil rights movement, inspired by the fact that what was going on in American history now, such as I could access it, seemed to have everything to do with race and slavery and civil rights. When I went to graduate school, I wanted to study abolitionism, the coming of the Civil War, and I particularly wanted to study black abolitionists. And that's essentially how I landed on Douglas in graduate school when I did my dissertation on him. Okay. Uh, I, my, my, the best answer to, the, to your question though is, I love this subject. It has drawn me ever since I've tried to be a historian because it is so important. And we once again are living a historical moment when we're learning all over again how important this story of race is in the United States. It probably always will be. So on Frederick Douglass, um, they wrote three autobiographies. Right. So there's a lot about uh, his views in his own words. Mm. Why did you think it was necessary to write a biography of him? Because he'd already written three autobiographies. <laughs> and how long did it take you to write this? And did you have some special access to documents which helped you write this book? Oh, yes. Uh, well, th those are three great questions. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, on the autobiographies, uh, anyone who writes as a biographer and as a historian and even as readers, we should never trust anybody who writes three autobiographies. They're trying to impose a story on us. He wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography. That's his version. And they're brilliant. They're, they're, they're remarkable. They are, they are quite revealing in some ways and not revealing at all in other ways. Uh, so an autobiographer of that scope needs biographical treatment. Um, now, the reason I wrote this book is essentially the great good luck I had in encountering a private collection of Douglas material, now about 14 years ago, owned by uh, a man named Walter Evans. Uh, I went to Savannah, Georgia, uh, to give a talk to middle and high school teachers, which I've done many, many times, about Douglas's autobiographies because they were teaching them. And that day I met a local collector, Walter Evans, who is an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, but he went north for his higher education, Howard University, and then to the Michigan Medical School. And Walter then practiced uh, as a general surgeon for some 35 years in Detroit. But his great passion in life was collecting, other than surgery, <laughs> was collecting African-American rare books, manuscripts, and art. And he has, or he had, this extraordinary collection of Douglas manuscript material. And on the day I met him, he took me over to his house, a big, beautiful brownstone in Savannah. And he got out on his dining room table, a portion of that collection, the core of which are nine very large Douglas family scrapbooks. 
And that day I saw this stuff for the first time. I didn't commit overnight to doing a new biography because frankly, that was too daunting. I took months to figure out that I would do it. But I realized quickly after I saw that collection that if I didn't do this, somebody else would. Um, and the great value of that collection is that it covers essentially the last third of Douglas's life. Uh, his, two of his sons in particular collected uh, these scrapbooks. There are a lot of other materials too, a lot of family letters, a lot of photographs, a lot of other documents. Um, and it opened up a window onto Douglas's uh, later life like we had never had before. And anyone reading the book will see the Walter Evans collection all over the footnotes. There's one last good piece of news on this, and it's just been announced in the past month. After many years of negotiation, Walter has finally taken the offer and the Beinecke Library at Yale University, uh, Yale's great manuscript and rare book collection, has purchased that Evans collection and it is, as we speak, being digitized. So um, your book I, was something I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I've always admired Douglas for many reasons, but he was from Baltimore to some extent, my hometown. And we'll mm -hmm. talk about that in a moment. But for somebody that says, I don't know if I want to invest the time in reading an 857 page book. <laughs> um, so can you just tell that person who's not sure if he or she wants to read that book, why Frederick Douglass is such an important person in our history? What is the essence of what he did that has made him so important? He's the prose poet of American democracy. He was a genius with language, a genius with words. He gave a more thorough and poignant uh, and sometimes terribly honest critique of this thing called race and racism and slavery itself than any other American. He will help you understand the experience of slavery, both as a physical experience, but especially as a mental and an intellectual experience. Uh, Douglas was also a, a very significant thinker he was a significant political thinker uh, for, in the 19th century. Uh, and he also had a role, uh, a political role in helping shape to some degree, some policies of the US government. Now, he never held elective office. He held a point of office from three uh, American presidents. But he had a he had a role. He had a say. He had a somewhat insider's view of the development of policy in the United States in the latter third of the 19th right. century. But above all, it's Douglas, the speaker and the writer, who left more words to make us think about this problem of race than, frankly, anybody else except perhaps W. E. B. Du Bois in the 20th century. Okay, so uh, Frederick Douglass, born under a different name, is born in 1818 in Maryland. He's born to a uh, slave woman. Uh, he never finds out who his father is. Is that correct? He never knew in his entire life who his father was. Yes. And uh, he grows up as, on a as a slave um, in Maryland and sometimes in Baltimore. But uh, one of the amazing things that you point out in your book is that uh, not only were slaves not allowed to read or write, but he is secretly taught how to read and write. And that is to some extent, the reason he was so successful later on, he could read and write. And many people in that time didn't think that African-Americans were capable of reading and writing. Can you go through how he learned to read and write? Sure. Well, he first learned his letters, the alphabet, and then beginnings of how to read from his mistress, whose name was Sophia Auld, in Baltimore when he was seven and eight years old. Uh, she was not technically his owner. She was the wife of his owner's brother. He had been sent to Baltimore from out on the Eastern shore where he was born to be the playmate of a white boy named Tommy Auld. Uh, he took to reading like nothing else in his life. And Sophia Auld treated him like another son for a while until her husband, Hugh Auld, ordered her to stop teaching this kid to read. In fact, Douglas, in his autobiography, famously says, um, when Hugh Auld 
ordered his wife to stop teaching that slave boy how to read because the next thing he's going to want to know is how to write. Douglas wrote later, he said that, well, that was the first abolitionist speech I ever heard. <laughs> so <laughs> they don't want me to read and write, then that's the thing I ought to do. But then he seizes language, David, when he's nine, 10, 11, and 12 years old in the streets of Baltimore among his white playmates who are all wandering around with this school reader called the Columbian Orator. And he went about the business before he was 12 of managing a way to get his own copy of this book called The Columbian Order, which became a treasure to Douglas. He first came by language in the Bible, and then in his Columbian Order, and then in every newspaper, magazine, or whatever he could find to read. But it's worth pointing out here that his abilities with words were first in oratory, which he gets many chances to practice, even while he's a slave. First in oratory, the writing comes later, of course. Writing, frankly, is harder than speaking. But he was like any kid, I'm convinced of this, in his, in his youth while he was a slave. Every kid wants to find the thing they're good at, whatever it may be. And Douglas found he was good with words, good at reading them, good at speaking them, and good at influencing people with them. And by the time he escaped from slavery at age 20, he was already a budding orator and a budding preacher. Uh, before he actually escaped, uh, he was punished a number of times for trying to escape. He had uh, corporal punishment and other things, but he finally escapes at the age of 20, uh, aided by a woman who was a freed uh, slave, and this woman helped him escape to New York. Uh, can you describe how he did that and what happened to that woman? Yeah, well, that's Anna Murray, uh, who became his first wife. Anna was actually born free. Uh, she was the ninth, I, she was the oldest, I believe, of nine children. She was born out on the Eastern Shore, just like Douglas was. In fact, they were born about three miles apart. And they might have even known each other as little children, although it's not clear they would have remembered it. Uh, he meets her when he's a teenager. She was three years older. She worked as a domestic for a white family in the city of Baltimore. And you're right, they plotted his escape together. That much is clear. Um, he escapes at age 20. Uh, the plan they hatched, and it worked, uh, was first to study uh, the steamboat routes and the rail routes. And he dressed as a sailor. He had a big broad brim hat, uh, wide pantaloons, sailor's scarf. He even borrowed the identity papers of a black man who was a retired sailor. And on a day in late August, 1838, he jumped on the train in Baltimore and took it north, three train rides and three steamboat rides, and then one little ferry boat on the Hudson River. And 38 hours later, he was in New York City. Two days later, he got a letter off back to Baltimore, Anna, was illiterate and remained a non-reader the rest of her life, which is quite a story. But someone, they had planned this, we don't know for sure who it was done with, but someone Douglas wrote the letter to got the word to Anna. Anna had her bags packed, same plan, same steamboat, same trains, and she joined him in New York uh, where they were married in the parlor of a black abolitionist himself, a former fugitive slave, named David Ruggles, and then they hurried off to New Bedford, Massachusetts, which would be their first home in freedom. It was a brave, incredibly risky escape plot, and had he been caught, uh, we would never have heard of him again, and we wouldn't have been talking about him. I, I think he was um, a, a fugitive for about nine years, and ultimately some friends of his paid for his uh, being purchased from his slave owner. Is that correct? It is correct. He goes off to England, well, first to Ireland, Scotland, and Britain in 1845, right after he published his first autobiography. He spent almost 19 months in the British Isles on that visit, which was an extremely important pivot in his life. Uh, he was adored in Ireland and Scotland and parts of Britain. 
by the British anti-slavery community and by others. He made many important friends in Britain and Scotland, uh, lifetime friends, and a group of them, uh, led by actually the Richardson sisters of Newcastle, uh, raised the money to purchase his freedom. Not just to purchase his freedom, but they did all the negotiation and communication back to Maryland with Thomas and Hugh Auld, who were Douglas's owners. And Douglas chose not to return to the United States until he had the free papers in his hands from Thomas Auld. And then Douglas in the spring of 1847, uh, he's now 29 years old, returned to the United States. What did it cost to buy his freedom? About $740. <laughs> so, the purchase was made in British pounds, uh, which was 150 some odd British sterling, but it came out to about $460. So when he does come back, um, he abandons the th things that he had done earlier when he was a, a fugitive, which is some manual labor, but he mm -hmm. basically becomes full-time speaker, yeah. uh, working very closely with anti-slavery groups led by William Lloyd Garrison and others. But was he by far the most effective speaker against slavery that, that had been a former slave or the most effective speaker of any type against slavery at that era? He was one of a couple or three of the greatest of the abolitionist orators. There were those who said Wendell Phillips was comparable. There were those who said a few other people were comparable. Douglas had a skill with oratory, even while very, very young. He was first discovered, if you like, by the Garrisonian abolitionist in 1841. He gives his first speech out on Nantucket Island to uh, uh, the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, his first speech ever to white people. And uh, then they hired him and took him out on the, on the road, on the circuit, where for the next three and a half to four years, he traveled almost constantly with groups of other abolitionists uh, out on the circuit, giving anti-slavery speeches. He had the ability of an orator to capture an audience, to capture their imagination, to entertain them. He was a performer, make no mistake. He was a great mimic. And he had the ability to reach their heart, right? to reach the moral core of wherever they were in their own lives. But a lot of what Douglas did in his early years out on the circuit was just tell the stories of his youth, tell the stories of his life growing up as a slave. And it was those stories that he sat down in the winter of 1844-45 and basically just wrote up with transitions, actually brilliant and beautiful transitions, into that first narrative that he published in 1845. So when he's riding the circuit, in effect, making speeches and getting paid for it, that's how he's supporting himself. Um, he's doing this, obviously, in the northern areas, but is he that popular in the north? He's never physically attacked, nobody threatens him, or is that not the case? No, he got, he got attacked many times. Uh, uh, abolitionists were not popular, by and large. Now, in some small New England towns, they were pretty safe. But once he started speaking out in... Pennsylvania, out in Western New York, and especially out in Ohio, Indiana, and in the Middle West. Uh, then they just called it the West. Uh, it was very dangerous. He was once attacked by a mob, 1843, in Pendleton, Indiana, and nearly killed. Uh, the mob attacked the stage. It was an outdoor stage with a group of abolitionists. Uh, they, they were attacked with, with rocks and then with chairs and everything. Douglas got into a fight. He broke his wrist, which was never really set properly the rest of his life. He was thrown off trains. He was thrown off steamboats. Um, he was threatened many, many times. And I've been asked this question many times, so I might as well just address it. I've been asked many times, why wasn't Douglas assassinated? Well, I can't say for sure, but what I do know is Americans didn't carry guns in the 19th century. They really didn't. When he speaks out in Ohio or Indiana or Southern Michigan, and some farmers might come who would heckle him, and they might throw rotten eggs at him. That happened many times. One time he had a live pig thrown at him, a small piglet. On, he was on an altar of a church. And they just threw an animal at him. But they tended not to come with guns. 
uh, hunter, I mean, farmers would have a hunting rifle, but they didn't walk around with them. Right. So um, it is a small miracle that he was not more badly injured or indeed killed out on the circuit. But we just have to remember that guns were just not as plentiful in that society as they are now. Now, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln runs for president. He's seen by the South as not being uh, favorable to slavery. Does uh, Douglas support Lincoln in 1860? Uh, very mildly. In 1860, Douglas was still not quite sure how to shoulder up to the Republican Party. He was very glad the Republican Party had come on the scene. He had been inspired by this new anti-slavery party from 1854 on. And before that, he was inspired by the Free Soil Party as early as 1848. And Douglas got very much involved in anti-slavery politics in the 1850s. But he wasn't sure yet by 1860 just what could be trusted from his point of view, which was a, as a radical abolitionist, about this Republican Party, which stood pretty clearly for stopping the expansion of slavery. But Douglas, as he said, looked in vain for a moral core to their argument. However, as he also said in 1860, he nevertheless admired Abraham Lincoln's anti-slavery tendencies. Douglas came to understand that this Republican Party it wasn't that easy to understand this at first, but he came to understand that if, if these people were attacking slavery in the West as a, in effect a moral issue, because they were saying to Southerners, you will not expand this system into the Western territories because there we can control jurisdiction. Douglas came to understand that if you're attacking slavery in the West, you're really attacking it everywhere. Now, he's going to take his time to shoulder up to and warm up to Abraham Lincoln once the war breaks out, too. But that will change in 1862 and 63 with both the preliminary and the final Emancipation Proclamation. He meets with Lincoln, I think, three times. Right. Are, are they friendly or not friendly? Oh, no, they were, they were very friendly meetings between two human beings, although... The first meeting, which is August of 63, was testy because Douglas had gone to Washington with no invitation. Actually, it was the first time he ever set foot in Washington, D.C. He went to the White House, just got in line, the famous lines that would gather at Lincoln's White House, and uh, asked to see the president. And lo and behold, Lincoln let him in. But the reason Douglas went that first time was to protest the discriminations, brutal discriminations that were being practiced against black soldiers uh, in the war. Because by then, late summer, uh, Douglas has been recruiting black soldiers into the 54th and 55th Massachusetts regiments ever since April. And the, the discriminations against black troops were brutal. He went to Lincoln to complain about this and demand that that change Lincoln made no real promises at that point. They had what today in diplomatic language uh, they both called, in effect, uh, a good exchange of ideas. However, Douglas was impressed with Lincoln personally. There's no mistake about that, because he went back and he wrote in letters of how he was impressed with Lincoln as a person. He said he had never been in the presence of a white man with power who treated him so well. Now, ultimately, only two more times, a year later in 64, a much more uh, friendly and important meeting. And then they'll meet again on the day of the second inaugural in the spring of 65. Now, ultimately, the Civil War ends and um, the 13th Amendment is uh, ratified. So is Douglas's life work over? He wanted to eliminate slavery. It's over. So what did he do next? His life wasn't over at all, although we worried about that. As you know, I have a chapter in the book where he says, uh, when he's remembering that moment of the end of the Civil War, he remembered it through a line in Shakespeare's Othello, where Othello says, Othello's occupation is gone. He's lost his status. Uh, who will want to listen to me anymore? Douglas worried about that once emancipation had come. But it turns out he had more work to do. In fact, the last 30 years of his life to try to preserve and protect the great results of the war, which were 
emancipation, of course, of four million slaves, but then the establishment of civil rights, the establishment of political rights, the establishment of that 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, equality before law, and then to try to fight back as best one could with the only weapon Douglas ever really had, which was words and language against the terror and the violence that was being practiced in the South by the Klan and its many imitators as a way of overthrowing Reconstruction. And then Douglas would have many other roles to play uh, as a kind of insider Republican, as a great symbolic black leader, uh, and then even as a diplomat for the United States uh, during those last 30 years. The 13th Amendment eliminated slavery. The 14th Amendment made African-American citizens, mm. former slave citizens. The 15th Amendment gave them the right to vote. Now, mm. in the right to vote, he had been a big advocate uh, of women's right to vote, suffrage for women. In fact, he was at the 1848 Seneca Falls Conference. Right. Why did he have a falling out with the suffragettes because he opposed having them have the right to vote in the 15th Amendment? Can you describe that? Sure. Well, as you say, Douglas had always been a women's rights man. Make no mistake about that. He was at the Seneca Falls Convention. He even advocated black, uh, excuse me, women's economic rights. Uh, for example, in the New York State Constitution in the 1850s, rights to property, rights to uh, rights after divorce, and so on and so forth. But in 1869 and 70, with the passage and ratification of the 15th Amendment, the Voting Rights Amendment, women were not in it, as everyone knows. And uh, Douglas had a terrible falling out with the leadership of the women's suffrage movement at that time, particularly Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony. They had been strong supporters of the abolition movement, of black rights. But when the word male got put into the Constitution in the 14th and 15th Amendments, they rebelled, they revolted. But to make a long story short there, the problem was they were not only impatient with this process and they had a right to be impatient, they attacked back with racist language and racist ideas. They can only be called that. And, and the primary biographers of both Stanton and Anthony have directly addressed this. Um, they said things like, Stanton, for example, said, you know, if, a, if an ignorant black man can go to the polls and cast his ballot, why can't sophisticated white ladies like us have the right to vote? And they sometimes even employed the N-word. And they attacked Douglas as well. Now, anyone with one eye open understood that if you had put women's suffrage into the 15th Amendment, it simply never would have passed Congress. It was an all-male Congress. It just wasn't going to happen. And that falling out was never really reconciled his, down to his death. His public image was uh, certainly pretty good, I would say. Uh, people thought he was a great orator. He mm -hmm. was a great writer. Mm -hmm. And many people idolized him, uh, even if they didn't necessarily agree with him. Why yeah. did he take such risk in his personal life? He essentially mm -hmm. had two European white women living with him for quite some time while he was married. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, he marries a, a white woman after his uh, wife dies, his first wife dies. Can you describe that complicated personal life he had and whether, because he was associated with white women, which was quite unusual right. then, what, what the effect was on his uh, life? Well, that's an entire book, David, as you know, and I weave it throughout the book. The first woman we're talking about here is Julia Griffiths, an English woman. He met her in England in 1846. Uh, he had Julia Griffiths in his life for six years in Rochester, New York, 1849 to 55, because he needed her. Julia Griffiths was a brilliant, well-educated woman from Britain who came to the U.S. to join the American anti-slavery movement. She moved in with the Douglas family for three years. She helped Douglas run his newspaper, was his assistant editor on it. She was his personal editor, and she was his fundraiser. She even bought the mortgage on the Douglas's house so they could save the house. I do not believe that relationship was ever a sexual relationship. I can't prove that. Uh, we know a lot about that relationship, but uh, that's at least my conclusion and the conclusion of most other Douglas scholars. Um, then he had a 22-year relationship, roughly 22, 
with a German woman named Otilia Assing, whom he met in 1856. That's very complicated. She was a highly educated German woman, the daughter of German 48ers. She was a, a German Jew who did not practice Judaism. In fact, she was a fierce atheist. She latched on to Douglas uh, after 1856. She translated his second autobiography into German, and she did her best to try to insinuate herself into Douglas's life on and off, on and off for the next 21, 22 years, including coming to stay some summers for three, four months at a time in the Douglas home in Rochester, New York, and even after he moved to Washington. That relationship was a problem in the home. There's no question about that. And my own view is it probably was at some point in its history an intimate relationship. Can't prove that either way. And by the way, 99% of all of the written evidence we have about this particular relationship is only from Ossing and not from Douglas. That's going to end tragically, to say the least, uh, in 1884 although he had put Ossing out of his life several years before that. And as you suggested, he then did marry uh, a woman named Helen Pitts, a uh, white woman, 20 years younger, uh, in 1884, a woman who was working in the recorder of deeds office. Douglas was appointed recorder of deeds. He had eight people working as clerks. She too was a highly educated, quite brilliant woman very well read, with great anti-slavery credentials. She had worked in, in slave refugee camps during the Civil War, caught malaria, nearly died. Uh, and by all accounts, the last 11 years of Douglas's life, he was a lucky man to have this very companionate uh, marriage to Helen. That marriage, though, and we can leave it there if you want, was probably the most scandalous marriage of the 19th century because uh, the most famous black man in the United States, if not the world, married a white woman in 1884. I mean, that would be news today, uh, I suppose. Uh, then it was more than news. It was a scandal. And it didn't set well either uh, with his own adult children. They had a hard time owning up to or accepting Helen although they did their best. Uh, so yes, he had, why did he take these risks? Because he needed these people, because he needed intellectual companionship, because he needed their support. And beyond that, uh, I do have other kinds of speculations in the book. I, it's very easy to understand why he would marry Helen Pitts. She was the perfect companion, it turned out. And they even did an 11 month tour of Europe and the, the Mediterranean in 1886, which is extraordinary, and he kept a great diary on that trip. The Ossing story, the German woman, is the one that's very difficult to fully explain, but in the book, I give it my best shot. <laughs> oh, a final question. Uh, he dies in 1895 from a heart right. attack. Was right. he honored upon his death? Were there big ceremonies? Was he treated like John Lewis was treated, or not quite that way? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I've been thinking so much about that the last few days watching the John Lewis funerals. Uh, Douglas's death was a national event, make no mistake. There were obituaries all over the country, including in the South, favorable ones even. He had become a phenomenon. He had become one of the three or four or five most famous Americans, make no mistake. He, he was, we believe now, the most photographed American of the 19th century. He actually had a terrible problem with fame. Uh, he couldn't go anywhere, as they say, without being recognized. His funeral in Washington, D.C. was held out of the Metropolitan Amy Church. It was a huge event. It was attended by a Supreme Court justice, many members of Congress. His funeral in Rochester, New York, was uh, an all-day civic event, the whole city shut down to bury Douglas in Mount Hope Cemetery. Uh, as I said, the eulogies went on and on and on. There was poetry written about him, songs written about him. He did not have a state funeral like John Lewis did. 
because Douglas never held elective office. And in 1895, it's not clear a black man would have ever been given that great honor. But he did have the recognition in his death of a very special, uh, unique American personality. And I end the book, as readers will see if they get to page 800, and I hope they do. Um, he dies at a moment that is really a kind of a passing of the baton, especially in African-American leadership. He dies the very year just before the summer that Booker T. Washington gave his famous speech in Atlanta called the Atlanta Compromise Speech and burst on the scene as the new most prominent leader of black America. And he dies just as W.E.B. Du Bois is coming into his own as a young intellectual. And Du Bois wrote an extraordinary eulogy of Douglas that I use near the very end of my book. And so there's a kind of a passing of the generations uh, when Douglas left the scene in 1895. So Louise, um, can you uh, give us some questions that some of our viewers might have or members might have for David? Yes, um, terrific. Thank you. First of all, thank you uh, very much to both of you. And uh, I should, should mention, I should have mentioned at the start that we have been so inspired by David Blight's work on Frederick Douglass at New York Historical that we actually created a Frederick Douglass Council. And I believe that the head of that council, Mercedes Franklin, is with us this evening. Um, Hello, Mercedes. <laughs> we've got some uh, great questions here. Um, I am going to uh, slightly modify the first one from Ailea El Amin and actually ask it of you, David Rubenstein, because you wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post about uh, recommending that the Lee Memorial uh, the name of the Lee Memorial, I should say, be changed. And um, Ailea is concerned uh, about erasing history, rewriting history, and um, I, I think motivated by David Blight's remark uh, about um, putting 21st century monuments up in place of those we've taken down, uh, whether you know, we'll end up with some politically correct names or statues or, um, or memorials and so on and so forth. Uh, that don't teach us anything about history at all. So I'm, I'm going to ask that of you, David uh, Rubenstein, because I think David Blight has pretty much spoken to that question. Well, let me just explain. Arlington House at the top of Arlington Cemetery was originally built as a kind of uh, house to honor George Washington, who was the step-grandfather of the person who built it, George Washington Custis, um, who built it. And um, it was really supposed to honor George Washington. Ultimately, Robert E. Lee marries into the Custis family. He lives there for 30 years. Uh, the, the house is taken over by the North during the Civil War. And then ultimately, a cemetery is built to, to bury Northern soldiers there, recognizing that Lee, when the war is over, would never come back and want to live in a place where there's a cemetery of Union soldiers. Ultimately, uh, he, he does not come back there. He never visits it again. Uh, when he dies, his son sues. And the United States government ultimately lost the case. The, the, the house is given back to uh, the Lee family. They then sold it back to the US government. The US government ultimately decided to make a much larger cemetery there. And over the years, this, this mansion, called at times the Custis Lee Mansion, was restored as a house that shows you what it would look like to live there as Robert E. Lee. Um, I decided to put up the money to restore it because I thought it was falling apart a bit, mostly to honor George Washington, but mostly to really honor uh, the American soldiers who are buried there. It's at the top of, the, of this most sacred land in our country, and I thought a place at the top should be well-preserved. And so all that I've said is that I think it should be renamed the Arlington House, and that it should be seen as a, uh, something to honor the soldiers and also George Washington, and just take the Robert E. Lee name off. But you can keep all the Robert E. Lee artifacts that are in there, so you can see what it looked like when Robert E. Lee lived there, and I also insisted that the slave quarters be built out so that people could know it was a slave home when Robert Lee was, was there. So I just thought that the name should be changed to reflect what I think is most important about it. It's at Arlington Cemetery. So it's not really about erasing history or um, replacing names with contemporary, more contemporary, uh, let's say. I didn't judgment. want it to be torn down or anything. I just think it should right. be seen as a way to visit right. history, learn about it, 
but I didn't think we needed to honor Robert E. Lee particularly. And Robert E. Lee's great, great, great grandson, Robert E. Lee V, uh, sent me a letter saying he agrees with me. Okay, <laughs> there you go. All right, a question from Melissa Vale for David Blight. Um, this is such a time of re-examination and upheaval. Is there any way you would write the Douglas biography differently if you were starting today? Oh, Lord. <laughs> I've had that nightmare about 50 times since I published the book. What I could do different, would do different. I know one thing I would do, and I've known this since the moment I finished the book, there would be more on the 1850s. I won't even go into all the details of that, but the, that that hugely important political decade that led to the Civil War, it needed one more chapter. Given the events that are happening now, it's possible that now and then you might find my voice trickling in a little bit about the nature of social movements, uh, the nature of our current uh, political racial reckoning. Although I've received enough emails or letters from people who thought I had done a fair amount of that already. In some cases, they thought I had done too much <laughs> of, of referencing our present. Historians have to be careful with that, of course. I mean, the present and the past are always mixed, but when you're doing biography and doing history, you have to keep it in historical time. Uh, so I, I don't doubt, though, that if I were rewriting parts of the book now, uh, <laughs> something of this current moment might seep in because this has been, frankly, astonishing what we're living through. Okay, try to get to a couple more questions before we close. A question from Peter Goodman for David Blight. Can you describe Douglas's relationship with John Brown? How close did he come to being accused of complicity in the Harpers Ferry raid? Well, he was accused of complex complicity and had they managed to capture him, he in all likelihood would have been tried for uh, as an accomplice in treason and slave insurrection. Uh, his relationship with John Brown lasted over about 11 years. I have an entire chapter on this in the book. It's chapter 15. Uh, Douglas meets John Brown in the late 1840s. Uh, he always had trouble with John Brown as to what part of his character and his plans to really believe in. But as the 1850s went by, and they had more and more encounters, and Douglas became more and more aware of John Brown's schemes, uh, he was interested. And I'll just put it this way. As long as John Brown was talking about a plan that he sometimes called the subterranean passageway, that was John Brown's term, which was supposed to be a kind of over overground railroad. Brown floated these ideas at times. He never had much in the way of a clear strategy, by the way, but he floated these ideas that maybe they could funnel slaves out of the Upper South. They might create some forts along the way in the border states and funnel slaves somehow to freedom. Douglas was listening by the late 1850s, and it is a measure, as I argue in the book, of how desperate abolitionists had become. Douglas was willing to shoulder up to the possible uses of violence. He parted ways with John Brown, and this is all in the book, when he realized Brown was planning to attack Harper's Ferry, which was the largest federal arsenal in the United States, and Douglas saw it as a suicide act, which in effect is what it was. But Douglas had to escape for his life, as many may know, after the raid, he had to escape to Canada and off to England, uh, and he got out of Rochester, New York, about 24 hours before federal marshals were about to arrest him as an accomplice, because there was a lot of correspondence between Brown and Frederick Douglass. Well, um, we're coming up to the, the end of our time, but um, as we're on the cusp of the celebration, commemoration of um, the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, um, can you answer very quickly this question about Douglas attending the Seneca Falls Convention? Did he? And oh, yeah. how did he get connected to the women's suffrage effort? Well, he sure did. He was at Seneca Falls. Um, he uh, actually, uh, <laughs> He did not take Anna, his wife, with him, because Anna almost never traveled with him. 
So I can't explain exactly why Anna wasn't there. Douglas was the only black abolitionist to speak at the Seneca Falls Convention. He signed the Declaration of Sentiments. Most of the husbands of most of the leaders of the Seneca Falls Convention, in effect, conveniently got out of town. Douglas was a very visible, robust supporter of women's suffrage, and as I said earlier, even of women's economic rights in the entire antebellum period. He had very strong relationships with lots of the leaders of the women's suffrage movement. The falling out, as David and I discussed, came over the 15th Amendment later. However, Douglas wrote a great deal about women's rights. In fact, there's a short reader uh, edited years ago by Phil Foner uh, called Douglas on, Wom on Women's Rights. He wrote numerous essays on this. He, even after the war, he, he gave speeches entitled, I am a women's rights man. <laughs> uh, and on the last day of his life, uh, the day he died, he attended a women's rights convention in Washington, D.C. He sat on the same stage. He sat right on the stage, if not right next to, close to Susan Anthony. They weren't that close anymore, but there they were on the same stage. He didn't speak that day. They just wanted him to be there and sort of, you know, be famous and be Douglas. Uh, but he just, he attended just to show his support. He's 77 years old at that point. He's got heart disease, his hands shake. He took the carriage home that day, collapsed of a heart attack at 6 p.m. And Susan Anthony, when she heard the news, went immediately up to Cedar Hill, Douglas's house, and broke down on the floor with Helen Pitts, Douglas's wife. So who knows what was going on emotionally around that event. But here were two people who had given their entire lives to radical reform and had all the scars to show it and had had their own battles with each other. But in Douglas's death, Anthony's first move was to go to the house and try to be there uh, to acknowledge, I think, probably, that Douglas had been important to their movement. But of course, obviously, the leaders of the 19th century women's, women's suffrage movement will never live to see um, the uh, women's right to vote, which doesn't come, of course, till the 19th Amendment. Well, look, this has been a great evening, and I thank both of you for, for joining us and uh, for a great conversation. Um, I think we have all learned a lot, um, even those of us who have read your book, David, and um, got a lot, lot more insight into Frederick Douglass and the importance of history more generally. So thanks so much to both of you. Thanks to everyone watching this evening. Stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you very soon back at New York Historical next month. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks, Good night. Thanks, David. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for doing it. Take care. Thank you.